Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura DeCastro. I'm a senior project manager in CTA's Office of Administration. I'm pleased to be here today to welcome you to another of President Dorval Carter's informative and engaging chats. I am very blessed to be here today because I would not be standing here if it were not for the two men I'm about to introduce. You see, I had the honor of working for Secretary Fox at the U.S. Department of Transportation as his Director of Scheduling in Advance. For those of you unfamiliar with this role, I'll just tell you that it's a job where you're behind the scenes, making the Secretary's meetings, events, and travel go off without a hitch, hopefully. It is a job, much like many of yours, very far from the limelight I am standing in today. But it is one that took me around the country and around the world and afforded me the unique opportunity to meet with community and transportation leaders on all levels of government. One of the biggest perks of traveling with the secretary, which he knows I really enjoyed, was being able to travel home with him to Charlotte because I too was born and raised there. And it was actually on one of those trips home that I had the chance to meet and get to know our own President Carter. It was a little over four years ago that I picked up the president from the Charlotte airport to join the secretary for a trip that would lay the foundation for the President Carter becoming Secretary Fox's acting chief of staff. And boy, am I glad I had the opportunity to work for the secretary in that capacity or else I wouldn't be here with y'all today. <laughs> the discussion today will feature features one of the most dynamic, distinguished, and not knowledgeable leaders in the transportation field, Anthony Fox previously served as the United States Secretary of Transportation under Chicago's very own President Barack Obama. He currently is the Chief Policy Officer of the popular ride-hailing service Lyft, and will share with us his insights as to what the future of transportation and the changing landscape of mobility may hold. As I previously mentioned, President Carter served as Secretary Fox's Acting Chief of Staff in Washington before coming home to lead our agency. During their time together in our nation's capital, Secretary Fox, with the help of President Carter and other senior staff, led an agency with more than 55,000 employees and a $70 billion budget. The DOT's primary goal was to ensure that America maintained the safest, most efficient transportation system in the world. Before even going to DC, Secretary Fox already had demonstrated strong leadership and political skills as mayor of Charlotte. He made transportation investments the centerpiece of Charlotte's job creation and economic recovery efforts. His accomplishments included extending the Lynx light rail system, which was the largest capital project ever undertaken by the city. He also started the Charlotte Streetcar Project. Today, Secretary Fox is bringing his considerable expertise in transportation, technology, and public-private partnerships to Lyft. He is uniquely qualified to discuss mobility issues, including the pros and cons of ride hailing services and their impact on public transportation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our boss, CTA President Dorval Carter, and my and the President's former boss, Anthony Fox, Chief Policy Officer of Lyft and former U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day to uh, come come sit in on this fireside chat. Um, uh, Anthony, I should let you know that what you what you have here in the room is a cross section of CTA employees, both here at headquarters and also out in the field. Great. Um, uh, we have been doing a number of these chats over the past few months, and I. Uh, uh, think that they have been very well received, uh, as I know this one will be uh, as well. Um, I'm going to get started by really sort of focusing in on sort of your roots growing up in Charlotte. And um, I know that from having spent time with you, I know how important that was in terms of developing your thoughts about transportation. And I would like if you could to share uh, that sort of experience and sort of what that meant to you uh, as you were growing up? Well, uh, first of all, Dorval, let me thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, President Carter. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dorval's fine. The, you know, protocol being established. Uh, thank you so much for having me and to all of, all of the uh, em 
employees here at the PTA, thank you so much for your great contributions to this wonderful city. Second largest transit system in the country. Um, so you all have a heavy responsibility every day. Um, I am really not Anthony Fox. I'm actually the grandchild of James and Mary Fox. If that could be my name, it would probably be more appropriate. Um, I grew up in the early 70s in uh, the west side of Charlotte, the African-American part of the city. And in an earlier point in time, that part of the city is actually a pretty rural country. Uh, but the city had gone through what a lot of cities, including Chicago, went through was a period of quote unquote urban renewal, or if you lived in the community, it might be called urban removal. And um, the black population concentrated in the west side of the city. So that's where I grew up. Um, my grandparents were teachers. They were, uh, my grandfather had been a principal in the formerly segregated school system. I don't know why I keep getting this feedback. I'm gonna do this a little differently. Okay, well just for now, I'll, I'll switch. But my, uh, my grandfather had been a principal in the formerly segregated school system and would tell stories about how uh, when he had to go meet with the superintendent, he couldn't go through the front door of the superintendent's house. He had to walk around the back um, in order to get in because it was not part of the social code for a black man to walk in the front door of a white person's house. Um, my grandmother taught French, and uh, thus my middle name, which is Renard. For those of you who know French, that means fox in French. And so... My name's technically Anthony Fox Fox, which is <laughs> one of those things you just get handed. Uh, you got you to you gotta roll with it. But anyway, um, they were just people who had been children of the Great Depression and part of that greatest generation. And they were just, you know, they gave every single thing they had to their family, um, including me. So growing up, uh, I was very conscious of the fact that I was among the first generation of my family to attend integrated schools. Uh, I was given the best of what my family had to give me. Um, and so I was very motivated to try to do my best to match what I was given. And, um, you know, we grew up in this corner of the city that was circumscribed by freeways, uh, I 85 and I-77, for those of you who, who travel along the East Coast, those are two of the most frequently traveled freeways. And um, those were, as I look back, they were actually walls. Uh, they were actually physical walls that separated me from the world beyond that. Um, and so I didn't know it then. I couldn't have expressed it that way. But the transportation system to me was more of a barrier to the rest of the world than it was a point of access. Well, and I, I also know that at, at some point in time, uh, as you start to grow up and, and start to use transit, you also started to see the value of what that meant. And, and you know, how did that impact you in terms of what you saw the benefits of public transportation being? Yeah, um, so one of my favorite stories is that I, I my grandmother, never got a driver's license. So uh, my grandfather would grumble on Saturday mornings when she'd want to go to the downtown to go to the mall. And so sometimes she would get on, I'd, she'd grab my hand, take me on the number six bus. We'd go down into the center city. We'd shop for a little while, and then we'd take the bus to go back home. And it was really my first indoctrination into the power of transit. You're talking about someone who you know, at that point was in her late 50s, early 60s, who never intended, never wanted to drive, but it was her way of having independence um, and not having to rely on her grumbling husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, I cl clearly your grandparents had a, had a major influence on you and, and your life. 
Are there other people that you view as being influencers in terms of your development as you were growing up and, and sort of establishing yourself in your career? Uh, there's so many people that I can think of. Um, uh, you know, I grew up in Charlotte right around the same window of time. I sort of melded into my teenage years around the time Harold Washington was elected here in Chicago. Uh, and our version of Harold Washington in Charlotte was Harvey Gantt, who was the mayor of our city from 1983 to 1987. And I just remember how cool he was. Uh, you know, he he wore a suit. He you know he looked good. He was smart. He was you know people liked him, and um, that was uh, he was an aspiration. Um, and so I I at least at that age developed a sense that I wanted other people to feel about me the way he I I felt about him. And so that was, that was one of the early ones. Uh, there were lawyers that I knew in town, um, including Julius Chambers, who was a civil rights lawyer, later ran the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, but before that had argued the case that effectively desegregated the schools in the city of Charlotte. And so I had many people around, even though I didn't know them as individuals, uh, but who were good examples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that um, one of the things that, that, that I say on a fairly regular basis, and the employees here hear me say this uh, uh, regularly, is transit is more than just moving people from point A to point B. Uh, it's about connecting communities. Um, I didn't, I, I'd love to say that I kind of thought of that on my own, but a lot of it. Probably did. <laughs> Actually, I may summarize it on my own, but a lot of it came out of conversation that you and I had about the purpose of transportation and why transportation matters. Um, the program itself, but also sort of your, wh why that program was important to you and what you were trying to accomplish uh, with that program um, when you were secretary. Yeah, um, so you have to like be patient with me as I explain this because there's several, <laughs> several layers of it, but um, the first most important level of it is that the thought experiment around Riders Opportunity was that our transportation system itself, and I mean this broader than transit, is a reflection of societal attitudes. If you really think about it, it's actually, we say what we think when we put that freeway that circumscribes that neighborhood. We say what we think when we decide to put that transit line in one place, but not put it in a different place. We say what we think through our actions as a society, and our transportation system is a reflection of our prejudices, our aspirations, our hopes, our dreams. And um, the question that I wanted to ask our own team at USDOT was, to what extent can our aspirations drive transportation decision making? In other words, if our goal as a society, and we have the most complex goal of probably any society on Earth, because we're not homogenous. We have many different influences, different peoples, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different languages, different religions. There are all kinds of things that make us different, but how can the transportation system be our example of how we actually want to live together? And. Uh, so that's like the first level, which is already hard for many of us to imagine. Uh, and so I was laughing when you said ladders opportunity because even though what we developed was like an amazing uh, set of actions around our grant programs, um, including equity as part of our consideration in awarding transportation dollars. Um, really for the first time that I can recall bringing community leaders from all over the country into USDOT to walk uh, what I call the professional citizens. You all know who I'm talking about. These are people that show up at every community meeting, every public input meeting, every, you know, and helping to educate them on what the steps are to get 
things done within uh, a transportation decision-making context. Um, so we did some very tactical things that sort of rolled up into the strategy, and I can now point to projects all over the country that are reflective of what we did. But I'll tell you, honestly, I got some of the most important information about how to do this well by going to some of the more homogenous parts of the world. Uh, I took a trip to Scandinavia, and I remember sitting in uh, Copenhagen at Gale Architects. Uh, they're they're a, an architectural firm, but they also do consulting on a number of other city planning related things. And they were describing a, an approach to public input that they had been promoting in Denmark that put a primacy on going out to communities where people are and talking to them about transportation projects in language that they use, not transportation ease, which we use, uh, getting away from calling the meeting at City Hall at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when most people are working and the people who you really need to hear from can't come, and trying to make it much more user-friendly to people. And, you know, it's amazing the kinds of things that can be done if we take a more neutral eye towards getting the input in from all influences. But, you know, I think the major thing that I was trying to do with that was to, to uh, challenge our unexamined assumptions about how fair we are, uh, how enlightened we are, and how, uh, you know, how our resources get utilized in ways that actually perpetuate the very things we don't aspire to. Well, and I think, you know, as, as you indicated, you didn't just talk the talk. You led by example. And there were more than a few decisions that you personally stopped <laughs> because you didn't understand why they were putting up the highway barrier for this part of the community and not for another part of the community and other things like that. And you, you used your position as secretary really as a, bu a bully pulpit to sort of drive that understanding in terms of the um, uh, actions that the department's going to take. And I, I, I know and, and certainly experienced some very difficult conversations you had to have with people mm -hmm. about what you expected of them and why you were not going to say yes <laughs> yeah. to something that had been through a very laborious process and was all ready to go but for one person's signature. Yeah. Um, from a leadership standpoint, mm -hmm. clearly that is an example of, of your leadership in terms of how you tend to reinforce what you are trying to establish in the organization. Can you talk a little bit about sort of, you know, your approach to that? Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and I admit that I'm somewhat biased because I kind of saw it <laughs> <Yeah>. play out <laughs> in, various, in various meetings that might have gotten uncomfortable at times. But Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's interesting um, because I, I, think, I think a lot of times in roles like USDOT secretary or executive roles such as the one that you occupy, um, there's a, the machinery will continue churning regardless of who's in charge, you know? Like there's certain things that just happen by rote. And the question you have to ask yourself is, um, what are the things that you believe or I believe or we believe together that are essential to the overall enterprise that need to be changed? And where do you jump in and start making those changes? Um, I think one of the m most difficult challenges for me was that uh, I, my goal was actually not just to get the tactical things done. It was actually to encourage, you know, the people who are part of the bureaucracy who do this stuff every day to also change the way they looked at their roles and responsibilities. and. Um, that requires a more patient approach. It requires saying the same thing 500 million times um, to different sections of your team. It's, it, it's, it's uh, accepting that people are going to interpret based on their own experiences. I'm, I'm coming from the experience that I have. Other people have a completely different context, and some don't have 
context at all for some of the things I was asking them to do. And so it also requires patience in understanding where people are coming from and trying to help them understand. Uh, and it also comes by way of, of celebrating those things that happen that you believe are good outcomes because then people see, okay, that's the, that's the thing to shoot for and, and then it becomes easier for folks to, to understand. So I, you know, I think there was a period of time when I came in uh, and I said what I wanted us to do and people were kind of like, ah, I don't really understand what he's saying. <laughs> And I remember having many conversations along the way, like, what is he saying? What is he saying? And really, I was saying two things. You have to remember, I come from a family of teachers. So that's like something fundamental you have to know about me is that I don't want you just to do something. I want you to understand what you're doing. And so I will sit here with you as long as I have to for that to happen because ultimately that's so much more powerful than you just doing something I tell you to do. And it was also very frustrating. Yeah, I think there. Are, no, I, I, yeah, I, I say that I, I say that from the from the perspective of um, in an organization like DOT, mm -hmm. not unlike an organization here, people just want to do what you tell them to do. You just yes. tell me to do it, yes. I'll just go do it. Yes, but that's not the type of change you were trying to bring about. No. You were trying to make a cultural change yes. in the way in which this organization thought about its responsibility. Yes, which meant you had to force people to not just do what you tell them, even though yes. they would ask you, if you just tell me what decision you want, then we'll do it. Right. You, were, I can remember sitting in meetings with you where you were just basically asking questions mm -hmm. and waiting for someone to give the right answer mm -hmm. to the questions that yeah. you were asking. Yeah. And everybody else was sitting there saying, why will not he just say he likes it or he doesn't like it? <laughs> 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 um, but I think, you know, there was a method to your madness, yeah. <laughs> in other words. Yeah, it was madness and method. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, that's, that's just the way I look at the world is um, there's only one of me, you know, but there are many of us. So if, if we can do something together, that's better than me doing it. Because I knew I was on the clock. You know, I had three and a half years and, you know, <laughs> people were going to be looking, you know, it's funny, I will tell you. I went to Air F Andrews Air Force Base to see President Obama off. And, uh, you know, Air Force One took off, and my detail looked at me like. <laughs> <laughs> they almost had to catch a lift. Uh, uh, but uh, I knew I was on the clock. Um, but the issues were not on the clock. And so, you know, what I was, what I was aspiring towards is, is getting the actions, but yeah, also starting to affect the way people so, saw things. I, I'll give you one example was, uh, uh, I, I never was satisfied with the degree to which we were looking broadly enough at, uh, at, uh, at approvals in the Federal Highway Administration. Um, and I kept hearing from our, you know, we have um, different modes of transportation have different different apparatuses, apparati, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, um, different ways of making decisions. And in the highway area, the state highway directors are enormously powerful, and the second most powerful group are the state DOT highway administrators. And so I kept hearing people say, well, I can't really... I can't really ask the state to do X, Y, or Z thing. I can't make them think about these noise barriers differently. I can't think about the, the, you know, the alternatives differently. And um, so one day I just said to my highway administrator, I said, we're gonna have all of these, all of our state FHWA people come to headquarters and we're gonna spend the day talking about this, this ladders of opportunity stuff. And it was an enlightening experience for me and for them because what they heard for the first, I don't think this has ever been done before by a secretary, number one, but what they learned and heard was they had a whole lot more latitude to sort of push the states on these equity questions than they were using. They just had never been, they'd never been convinced that that would be received well at headquarters. Um, 
and I was, you know, I said, yeah, it's, it's going to be received well. Go, go do it. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it just takes sitting down with people. And, you know, I'm not saying that we changed everything about the way the highway department works, but I think we went a long way in, in giving people greater license to weigh in when they see communities getting screwed. So as you use technical term. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as you took sort of your passion for inclusivity and, and um, you know, equity with you and moved into the private sector, mm -hmm. how is that playing out for you now uh, in your role at Lyft? Um, I'm enormously impressed with, with Lyft and, you know, I have to say I, I had a fairly, fairly good vantage point to look at a lot of different um, players, not just in surface transportation, but really just across the board. But in getting to know um, Logan Green and John Zimmer, I, I am firmly of the belief that their objectives towards cities and communities and the transportation ecosystem in general is very harmonious with where cities see themselves over the long term and where cities need to be long term. Um, they are in a, an interesting space that really wasn't even a thing, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and it's, you know, it, it has friction points along the way, but at, I think at the end of the day, uh, what they're about is really trying to create a frictionless transportation system uh, one that is part of the ecosystem but doesn't purport to be the whole ecosystem. Uh, one that functions well and harmoniously with transit. And um, yeah, so I, I, I saw this as like the, the closest thing in the private sector to extending what I was doing in the public sector. Interesting, interesting. Um, that's probably a nice segue into a broader conversation about the, the mobility ecosystem that we're operating in today. And I want to take a moment here before we, we begin that part of my, my interview um, to show a video okay. that, you, that uh, should be familiar to you. Um, <coughs> it is a uh, video of something that we worked on together when we were at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, and as I mentioned at our, our shared mobility conference today, in many, in many ways, you were a pioneer in both recognizing what was happening in transportation and really starting to begin that conversation about what the future of transportation was going to be. So let's just show the video and then I, I'll follow up with some questions. Our transportation system is amazing. Each day, it moves millions of passengers and billions of pounds of freight. But many of our roads, bridges, airports, transit systems, and ports were built by previous generations for previous generations. Changes are happening all around us. Our country is growing, demographics are shifting, and technology is transforming the way we do everything. We've got a lot to think about. We need a new approach. To meet the challenges of tomorrow, we need to start today. Beyond traffic is the place to start. In 30 years, how will you travel? Share your ideas at dot.gov slash beyond traffic. Together, let's envision a future in motion. So, beyond traffic. Yeah. As you, as you remember, we spent a lot of time yeah. <laughs> working on uh, developing <laughs> that, that plan and, and discussing it, but it was part of a, a, a sort of visionary statement that you wanted to make about the future of, of public transportation. And I should point out that it wasn't just limited to, to transit. Yeah. It was the entire transportation system and what you saw as the changes that were starting to occur uh, as a result of that. Um, that's obviously not a new issue for you. It's an issue that you also sort of faced when you were mayor uh, of the city of Charlotte as you started envisioning um, new public transportation investments and things of that nature. Um, I'm interested in, in having you sort of discuss your motivation for sort of wanting to have this conversation about the future of public transportation uh, and really, you know, how we should be looking towards investments in our transportation infrastructure. Yeah, um, 
can y'all hear me? I should be asking. Okay, so uh, we, <clears throat> the transportation department has periodically done these sort of long views of the transportation system in, in the modern era. Uh, Secretary Coleman was the first to, to really do a deep study of the system. And um, there have been a couple of attempts to do it in later years. I think Secretary Skinner and Secretary Slater also did similar work. Um, but <clears throat> I guess the, to answer your question, the, the, you know, we're spending billions of dollars every year on a system. And out of our highway trust fund, as you all well know, out of every dollar, 80 cents is going into roads and 20 cents is going into transit. And yet we're stuck in ever-growing traffic. Um, we have systems that in, in the Midwest and the Northeast um, that are, uh, have a lot of deferred maintenance. We have demographic trends that are pointing us into the southeast and the west where they've been more automobile dependent, less transit uh, dependent, and a need for new investments to kind of make an ecosystem work in those places. And I guess the, the short answer is we have been stuck in 1950 since 1950. And, and my question really has been you know, what's going to up-level the discussion about transportation? How do we actually solve the problem? And <clears throat> I didn't think in my wildest dreams that in the space of the three and a half years I had as secretary that we could lay out the problem effectively and get an effective solution passed by Congress but I certainly felt that we needed to lay out the problems in a way that identified that the solution toolbox we have today is inadequate and to start laying the foundation for a new conversation. You know, you also pursued a, I thought, somewhat novel approach to developing this plan. <coughs> uh, you didn't just look to the people within the department mm -hmm. to talk about it. You wanted to hear from the public. You wanted to hear from the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about why that was such an important part of what you wanted to see happen here? Yeah, I, <coughs> I wanted to make sure that what we put together wasn't, um, wasn't some administration document that got collected in dust because it wasn't viewed as something that had independent validity, uh, hadn't been rigorously looked at from lots of different perspectives and so we you know we went to a wide range of um, nonprofits um, to to stress test our thinking we did public input sessions we actually drafted it a year before the final report was produced and had a lot of public input sessions in between and it was actually surprising to my team by the way you know it's funny how history is you know um, at the time we started this project, if you had asked the 55,000 employees at DOT who wanted to work on this project, it probably would have been like me and the cat <laughs> down the street. Um, but after we did it, I had people on our team say, this was why I got involved in transportation to begin with. Uh, this was one of the most innovative things I've had a chance to work with. So I think the whole goal was to create a more public conversation, and you can't do that without engaging the public. Well, I think it was, it was a, um, uh, definitely a beneficial exercise to engage in, and I'm, I'm glad we were able to do it. You, um, you're now at Lyft, um, and I have historically, when I've discussed the relationship between um, the ride-hailing companies and public transit, I describe it as complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested in sort of your thoughts in terms of how do you see the future of the role of public transportation in TNCs, and do you see opportunities to improve 
the coordination and the complementary aspects that can occur between the two of them. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, <coughs> and uh, let me put it this way. So I, I, let me put my mayor hat back on, um, which is dangerous <laughs> in election <laughs> season. Uh, um, if I were a mayor today, I would call my equivalent of President Carter here into my office and I would say, we, we have like millions of people we need to move around. Uh, there are areas where we are absolutely bar none the most efficient game in town. There are areas where we have these private entities out there that are trying to provide service and access points that are door to door. How do we, how do we find a way to get better parity out of the fare box, providing the service to the maximum extent possible, but utilizing these new tools that are out there? And <coughs> you know, I think we're at a discovery phase in this. I don't think we're at a phase where the the patterns are known and the business models have trued themselves up completely yet. I think we're at the point of experimentation. But I think the opportunity is amazing to be able to give people better service than they've ever had before, maintaining the transit system's architecture and being able to create um, you know, frictionless mobility in cities. And I actually think we're, I think we're co-dependents. I actually don't think we're competitors. Um, but I also think, as I say that, that the conversation has to shift from win-lose to win-win. And, 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 you know, I think when transit agencies are very clear about what their non-negotiables are, but also is clear about like here, like we're here's some. Th what's what's your dream, President Carter, for like how a, a rideshare company could 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 help you problem solve? That's where we want to be, um, and I think I think that's where the opportunity is. Do you see that as sort of what the future holds yeah. for us in terms of this relationship? I do, um, and. Uh, you know, I'm as I'm as pro transit as anybody. I'm, I mean, I am. You, you, you can check, you know, check the record. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're not talking to someone who 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 doesn't understand the criticality of transit. Uh, going back to my grandmother and the number six bus in in Charlotte. Um, but I do think there are both and solutions here, um, and I you know I don't I don't. I wouldn't dare to say that I know the contours of what that looks like ultimately. But what I do know is that um, we've introduced a door-to-door -door opportunity for people. And in some cities, we're the only place, we're the only companies that are providing it to that level for, for regular people. I mean, I know that you know the wave um, uh, service is different, but you know, for the average person, that's that's a unique thing. And so, whether it's first mile, last mile, um, whether it's integrated uh, platforms that allow someone to seamlessly use CTA and a service like ours, um, I think those are like those should be low hanging fruit things. I think there's a lot more that we can do, but we have to vision together. What do you see? as sort of the future for public transportation? <coughs> um, so in Charlotte, we had this we had this planning framework that I'll use as a bit of a metaphor for what I think. And it was uh, a, an idea called centers, corridors, and wedges, OK? So the centers were like the centers of activity, like where the workplaces were, where the shops were, and so forth. The corridors were where the main thoroughfares where people, you know, large numbers of people needed to move at any given time. Um, and then the wedges were areas that were relatively protected from intense zoning, land use, and uh, arterial roads. So I think 
we could think about our transit systems as the spine, as the central nervous system for how large numbers of people move in mass. I think that is an element that is not going to ever go away, particularly in cities that have a long tradition, as you do, 125-year tradition of, uh, of rail transit here. Um, I don't see someone coming in and replacing that. Um, but whether it is providing a more tailored solution to the average user to get from their doorstep to that, that train or to uh, a center that's closer than the train can take them, that's where I think the opportunities are. And I, you know, I actually see at some point transit systems are going to end up behaving more like we do in that respect. Uh, or they're going to be partnerships that emerge in which we're providing a, uh, a similar service as we do privately, but we're doing it at a level of maintenance of effort on the transit side, so you're not losing money, but you're getting the benefit of kind of a, of a service that gets, gets people there. I don't think buses are going away either, by the way. I just think that, uh, that the on-demand aspect of it and the door-to-door -door aspect of it is a convenience that people are going to want. You know, you, you, you made a comment um, at the Shared Mobility Summit this morning about the challenge here isn't necessarily the regulation and technology and, and you know the rules and all that. You you, you really you, you suggest that the challenge really re resides in sort of you know the people yeah. and figuring out how this is going to work. You want to you want to share some of that with with uh, with with the audience here? Yeah, I mean, I goes back to kind of what I was saying a little earlier, which is that. Um, there are two ways we can build transportation in the future. We can build it based on the, the walls we have today. And we do have them. I mean, you know, uh, and that's the easiest way to do it, by, frankly. That's where you're going to get the least resistance. God knows, I, you know, I work my tail off to get a billion dollar light rail line built in Charlotte which was the hardest thing to do. And I got whacked every day over a $150 million streetcar that we were putting in the heart of the African American community and in the lower income uh, Latino section of the city. Um, so those projects that are actually trying to create the access points for people who have historically been underserved to try to bring them into the mainstream economy, into the activity and life center of a city, those are the hard things to do. Um, and I think involving people in public input in new and different ways, that's the hard thing to do. And so to me, it's like, I think we've got to go the hard way because the hard way is actually going to give us more of what I think we want, which is to feel like we live in a society in which everybody matters. Um, now, I'm going to tell you, having gone through this experience myself, that I think the hardest thing in the shared use mobility concept is the shared part. Uh, I really do. You can get technologies that give us the opportunity to ride in the car together, but man, if I'm not dressed a certain way <laughs> and I get in that car with you, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Um, uh, air, I'm maybe going off script here. Sorry, team. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think Airbnb experienced this. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. People can share a room in their home and all this other stuff. But, man, when the wrong person shows up at the door or, or the wrong person is opening the door, mm -hmm. that fric that's the friction that I'm talking about. And so I think we have to build towards a world in which these uh, these parts of our national heritage that we don't like to look at so much start to go away, not reinforcing them. And that takes work by everybody. You know, I, it's um, <laughs> it's interesting because I think, I, one, I agree with what you're saying about 
the challenge mm -hmm. uh, that exists with this. Um, I also think that people view technology as a savior for everything, um, and that there's a technological solution that's going to make this whole thing work, oh, you know, beautifully. Um, my, from my experience, it's, um, you know, as, as, as I indicated when, when I was introducing you, it's really about determining what kind of city you want, what kind of a community yeah. you want, That's and right. how does that, how does this fit into that expectation? Yeah. Uh, and sort of understanding your community and understanding how yeah. you basically reflect that in your transportation systems is probably the the most interesting and most difficult part of the conversation right now. Yeah, you know, it's uh, one of my favorite sets of courses in, in, in undergraduate study was uh, political philosophy. And if you check out, like, uh, The Prince or the Second Treaties on Government or uh, Leviathan, a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these books that got into like how political systems evolved really define the strongest figures as the ones that appeal to the lowest base. You know, so um, those who can get down to our most visceral selves tend to galvanize people better than those who push towards our aspirations. But those who push to our aspirations are the ones who help societies move the greatest distance. Um, and I think it's, like I said, it's harder. It's just harder. That's just the way it is. But if we don't, I guess the question is, what do we end up with? Let me give you two stories. Um, so I'm, I fly around a good bit. Um, and this is a story about, you know, not just technology, but how one experience doesn't necessarily correlate to another experience. Um, so I'm, I know what every airline, what time they close the door to get into the plane. So I always regulate myself to get there 60 seconds before that time. <laughs> uh, so there's one airline that uh, closed the door five minutes before their rule said they should close it. And it was because the people at the gate were at the end of their shift and they were ready to leave. So I walk up, I'm like, you can't close that door. They're like, the door is closed, the plane is pulled back, sorry. And um, so we go back and forth. And then the lady says, she says like, do you actually think you know my company better than me? I was like, well, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I say that because to your point, in a different, different way, technology, you know, technology is, it's like the highway system. We, we, we asked civ civil engineers to plan a highway system, and they did it. And actually, for every dollar spent, we've gotten s at least six dollars back, probably a multiple of that. So from an economic standpoint, it was successful. Uh, but we weren't asking them to solve the societal question. We were asking them to solve a mobility question. And so if we, if we disaggregate those two things, we're already making a mistake. Um, and that's, that's just the reality. The, 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 the second one is, second story is, just to show you what I'm talking about. My son, who's 12, uh, he, for his first 12 years of life, he was, uh, he was frustrated that he'd go to school and, you know, he tried his best in school, tried his best academically, performed pretty well. But he always has this feeling that he can't understand fully yet that there's an, there's an extra cloud hanging over him. You know, he's got every advantage that I never had, but he still feels that way. And he's in a generation that is using technology all the time. And this isn't coming from adults. This is coming from kids his age. So my point is, is that 
I do not fundamentally believe that technology is going to solve that for us. I believe we have to solve it and make the technology support and reinforce our aspirations. Well, and as, as you indicated in, in your comment, um, leadership is about being visionary and taking people someplace that they may not want to go. Um, and it's real easy to do whatever you want to to maintain the status quo. It's a lot harder to move move that 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 rock in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, I, I would expect that over the the position you held, particularly the public sector positions, sort of getting that rock to move has been probably one of your biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, but it's like. That's the, that's the whole thing. Um, you know, I guess the way I would frame it is I, <clears throat> and I'm actually working on a piece that I'm, I'm, I'm writing about this, but, um, you know, I, I am, I am African American, proudly African American. I can look back five generations. My great grandfather drove a truck in rural North Carolina. I could give you the whole story about uh, my family. I've got a picture of my great-grandfather, my great-grandmother. It looks like the black Norman Rockwell picture. It's amazing. But, uh, um, but back to my son a little bit. Like In his mind, he wants to be the best. He doesn't want to be the black best. He wants to just be the best. He just wants to be able to be accepted for what he has to offer. And when I came into public life, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and you find that we're still wrapped up in a lot of stuff that we've never been able to unpack completely. And it's a little bit like the smallpox, you know. In order to, in order to rid yourself of the smallpox, you have to inject yourself a little bit with the smallpox. And so I feel like we have to acknowledge, embrace where we are as a society, and then put our aspirations into what we do. And I, I just think that's, it's hard work. It's hard work figuring out what that would be for Chicago. Um, it's a wonderful city. We let you borrow Michael Jordan for a while. <laughs> <coughs> he still wore his North Carolina shorts, so just, just to be cool. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful city. But there are fissures here. There are. Um, and we can't, we can't address those fissures without addressing those fissures. Yeah. You know, when we were, when we were discussing earlier, when we were talking about lapse of opportunity and mm -hmm. the role you played as secretary, you know, you were, you know, an African-American male mm -hmm. in a cabinet position for an African-American president. Um, clearly, um, with that role came a certain level of obligation and responsibility that you had to your community. Um, and I can remember, I remember when we, one time we came to Chicago, um, it was actually to do a transit event. Was it cold? No, it was in the summertime. Because <laughs> you didn't believe in coming to Chicago when it's cold. <laughs> um, uh, but we, we did we did the transit event, and then we did another event mm -hmm. on the far south side of the city mm -hmm. with a program that basically provides bicycles mm -hmm. to under you know to kids in, in low ec economic communities. And I remember asking you, mm -hmm. why why was this event a part of what you wanted to do? Mm -hmm. And you gave me a, a I thought a, a beautiful answer, and I. I if you remember it, I'd like for you to share it with the, with the group here because it had a lot. It, it had to do. <laughs> it had to do with the fact that these kids will probably never get a chance to meet yeah. someone as an African American sitting in a position as a cabinet secretary to the president of the United States, but for this time that you were there to see them, and you talked to them. You mm -hmm. talked to them about what it took. Mm -hmm. in your career to get to where you were. My question really is, 
Yeah, I'm about to cry, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, I was getting, I was getting a little teary eyes standing there listening to you, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, talk a little bit about sort of the responsibility you have felt, and not not ne just necessarily as Secretary of Transportation, yeah. but as Mayor of Charlotte and other public positions that you've held yeah. uh, to the community, to your community, and and how you have utilized your position, mm. not just to carry out you know, your responsibilities, but also to be a symbol yeah. of what can be, you know, what can occur, what can, what you can achieve. Uh, so it's interesting. Like I, I guess when you say that, it takes me back to my grandparents. Um, it takes me, like I actually feel like I'm, I really feel like most days I'm trying to represent them. Um, they, there was a guy I don't know if you all know the story about the Greensboro Four sitting at the lunch counter and all this other stuff, but one of the Greensboro Four was a great friend and mentor of mine. His name is Franklin McCain. He's passed away. But when I was running for office, I'm going to string these things together, by the way. Just give me a second. Um, he, he said to me something that I'll never forget. He said, you know, Anthony, I'm excited for you. I support you. You're going to do great things, but I want you to remember one thing. He said, there were people who came before you who were every bit as good or better, who never had the chances that you have. And I think about my grandparents that way. You know, they, they were not preparing me for the world they grew up in. They were preparing me for the world I was growing up in. And they wanted me to do as much and to go as far as I possibly could, and they did everything they could to do that. And when you have that kind of um, orientation, what you realize is that there are good people everywhere. Um, and when you walk past somebody, or jump in line, or you cut somebody off in conversation, or you, you know, you demean someone in some way, you don't have any idea who that person is, you know. On holidays, my grandparents used to pull out this, these plates. They were green and, and, and cream colored. And it was only later that I learned that while my grandfather was teaching, he also was a waiter at the local country club. And at some point, the country club gave him, I hope, <laughs> That's the story. <laughs> Gave him these plates that became the plates we ate on, you know, at a meal of significance. And, um, you know, I'm sure that in the course of that, that was in the 50s and 60s, I'm sure in the course of that, there were people who just dismissed him and ignored him and whatever. But his grandson became the Secretary of Transportation. You understand what I'm saying? So. So I just, I'm one of these people that just believes in the basic dignity of people. And if there's something even small, like my staff was watching me take selfies with people today at the Shared Use Mobility Center. Like I, you know, like if there's something I can do, even if it's a small gesture to give someone else just a little more of a lift or a little more of a lift with a Y, a y L, Y, F, T. That was good. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got that. Yeah. <laughs> a little more encouragement, then that's my responsibility. That's what people did for me. That's just, just how I am. Well, I think it certainly has been reflected in the way I've observed you uh, in the roles that I've, I've worked with you under. I think it certainly has had an impact on the people who work for you, um, who appreciate it and understand that. I, I, I'm reminded of the fact that the first time I met you, you were holding meetings luncheons with just random staff at DOT. And, you know, I, I was in a position where I would see the secretary from time to time and would certainly interact with them, but, you know, there was no reason for you to just meet with me um, other than you just wanted to hear what we had to say. Uh, and, and I remember that sticking with me from the first time that you, when we met you as secretary, was your approachability. Um, and the fact that, that you were the type of person who really 
cared about what we thought and what we were thinking. So I, I just want to personally thank you uh, for that experience because it certainly impacts me and it certainly impacts the way I approach uh, my job as, as president of CTA. Um, You've done okay. Yeah. <laughs> it worked out, I guess. Um, um, I'm actually kind of curious as to what you're going to say to this yourself because I don't know the answer to it. Um, have you, been that predictable so far? Is this no. okay? Uh, no, but I, I do admit the fact that I probably know you better than everybody else in this room. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I had a head start <laughs> to some degree. But it's also, I mean, to be honest with you, having known your story and having heard you articulate it to me and to others over the years, uh, I wanted everyone here to hear that because I think it is a, a, a testament to who you are as a person, but also the type of leader that you've turned out to be. Uh, and I think we've all benefited from that over the years. So I appreciate that. Um, when you get to the end of your career, mm -hmm. what do you want your legacy to be? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I would like, I'd say the, I have to talk this out because I hadn't anticipated this question, but I have to think about my life in chunks. Uh, the climb to, you know, Washington, D.C. Was, was a steep climb. Um, and um, I'm now in a place where I feel like I just want to do as much good in as many different venues as I can. Um, I guess the thread between all those things I would hope would be that um, that I helped I helped us realize that we are still part of this machinery that we at least say we don't like as Americans that we we aspire towards the American dream and the openness of it, but we still make it hard on ourselves. And that at every possible way along the points in my life, I've been part of trying to help open our society up and make it better. Um, that's what I was trying to do in the public sector. It's what I'm now trying to do in the private sector. Um, I hope I never get bored you know, uh, I want to keep doing stuff. I'll eventually write some books. I may teach some classes. I may, you know, I may get on the X Files one day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm gonna call David before I leave here. I said, "Man, why don't you call me, man?" <laughs> um, but seriously, I, you know, I just I want to live a life that's uh, an adventure that uh, that created a lot of good and maybe helped more people realize the power they have to make a difference, even if it's in one corner of the, of the world. Well, I certainly think that uh, you have made a difference, and you will continue to make a difference. And I want to thank you for taking the time to sit down with us and talk to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Anthony Fox. Thank you. So we have a, a tradition at CTA that we give to people when they retire from our agency and or very, very special guests. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we prepare a bus stop sign that sort of lays out their career. And we've created a sign for you uh, that I want to give you, but I also want you to take note of the number route that we picked for you. <laughs> The number six Anthony Fox Express, <laughs> which I want to hand to you as a you. gift from CTA. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dorval. You're welcome. And I also have for you another little gift from me personally. Um, one of the things that we're really proud of, and you talk about transit being more than just moving people and how you connect with communities, is the art program that we have at CTA that basically is a reflection of the communities 
that we serve and the various stations and, and bus turnarounds and throughout the systems that we uh, uh, operate in. And so this is a, a, a art book catalog for you of all the art at CTA uh, for you to enjoy and, and uh, take with you. So thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate it.